Thank you all. So Thank you. This, this format's going to be a, a little bit uh, different. What I'm going to, as many of you know, Murray Wise was the uh, original uh, founder of Westchester. Grew it to a substantial uh, business, uh, upwards of a billion dollars, and then, of course, was sold to TIAA, and ultimately, uh, Nuveen controls it now. Murray and I grew up, or I grew up in the town he worked in. He's a little bit older than me. From the looks of that picture, maybe a lot older, but if you're not close enough, I have a lot more gray hair than that picture now. Um, but I got started in the business of buying farmland as an investment because of a two-hour period of time Murray spent with me when I was 25 years old. Uh, I'm 60 now, and I, I think you're really sort of the father of the institutional investing industry. So I want to run through just sort of some questions, Murray, for you. Why don't you give a little bit about kind of your personal history in the farmland investment space and how you got the idea and got started and, and just uh, let the audience know a little bit about that background. Paul, I was born and raised in Southern Ontario on a grain and livestock farm between uh, uh, Detroit, Michigan and Buffalo, New York. Uh, had the privilege of going to Iowa State to do my undergraduate degree. And uh, my joke is I didn't know enough to go home. I fell in love with Iowa. I fell in love with the I States. And uh, at a very young age, like 17, I had the privilege of buying my very first small farm. And that was just the launch of my interest in farmland. How much per acre did you pay for that farm? 300 and some dollars. <laughs> Do you still own it today? No, I don't. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fantastic. But I traded it into a larger farm. Into a larger farm. Indirectly, I do. So you've spent a lot of your time investing in the core of the Midwest, Illinois, Iowa, Indiana. Um, it's a very low cap rate environment in terms of current yield. Why, why have you focused so much of your effort in that area? Well, along with that, Paul, I've had the privilege of investing in, in personally in California, Florida, um, uh, Arizona, other states. And I keep coming back to the I states. It's a great place to be, number one, a great tenant base. And it doesn't matter what happens, you know, there's somebody to farm your farm on a quality basis, uh, rent payable in advance, and, and a very secure position. I just truly love the I states. I, I, they're very productive. Uh, frankly, I've never had a bad crop, and uh, it's just been very rewarding to me and my family. Um, so, so you and I both lived through, I was in high school and college, of course, but the high inflation uh, environment that we had in the, in the 1970s and into the 80s, and then, of course, the, the, the significant downturn in farmland values uh, in the mid-80s, compare where we are today to that. Or is there a better uh, era you should compare it to? Paul, frankly, I don't think there's really any comparison. First of all, we had a very high inflation. Yes, we might be headed uh, there again. Who knows? We had extremely high interest rates. To think we had 12, 14, 16% interest rates is, is unbelievable. We had relatively low grain prices, believe it or not. And it was a pretty tough time. And I, I don't think it really relates to what we're seeing in uh, America today. Yeah, we certainly had in that area big, big surpluses of uh, right. beans and butter is a, a common expression. Um, and that doesn't happen today. We really are consuming these really large crops, uh, which we weren't back then. I, I would guess there's a few people in the audience that remembers payment in kind, where the government, uh, instead of giving you cash, gave you bushels of corn, believe it or not. Seems yeah. unbelievable looking backward. <clears throat> uh, ab absolutely. So what do you... Uh, what do you think will be the per percentage gain for high quality Illinois or Iowa farmland in the uh, 2022 calendar year? Paul, frankly, I remain very, very bullish at the Midwestern states. I think we'll have uh, uh, very attractive gains again. We're having a lot of high sales in, in many regions of, uh, again, of the I states. And I think the, the returns will be significant double digit. Do you think that'll go on in 2023 as well? For a brief period of time, and then we'll level out and adjust. The, um, so when we look at, at what's going on with these, these high prices, I mean, as, as you know, Murray, we're still active as buyers at Farmland Partners, even in the Midwest, um, even, you know, not at the very highest prices, but at strong prices. Um, is that an investor-driven market, 
or a farmer driven market? Totally and completely not an investor driven mar market, Paul. It's, it's a farmer driven market. Uh, don't try to compete with the farmer next door if he's decided he's going to own it because you're not. So, so a lot of, you know, a lot of our colleagues, because we're really finance people at the core, even though we started as ag people, um, you know, I think a lot of us look at those farmers and say, uh, you know, that's crazy that what they're paying. And it, it's not actually my perspective, but I think people ask that question and legitimately so. Do you think the farmer is, you know, way out over his skis at these prices or does it make sense for them? Absolutely not way out over his skis, Paul. And on the basis that, keep in mind, we have what, something like 13% indebtedness in the United States and the egg. Uh, space today. These farmers have cash in the bank. Uh, they, they don't have an interest in, in buying two-year, five-year government bonds or additional stocks, uh, whatever. They understand the farm next door. They understand what they can do with the farm next door, and they're going to buy it. Yeah, I, I always look at it, and I think they're taking the land return and the operating return, which is why they rationally can outbid an institutional investor anytime they choose to. Anytime they choose to pull, yeah, frankly. Yeah. Um, so roll roll forward. You have have been more or less bullish farmland your whole career, and I don't mean just the next two years. Uh, you know, I, you and I share the view that this is a long term hold period kind of asset. You bullish for the next decade. The next 20 years, what's your perspective today? No, I'm, long, I'm bullish longer than that, Paul, on the basis that Valerie and I have a very substantial uh, family foundation. I think there's uh, 60 or 62 years remaining in the family foundation. And upon my demise, every acre that I currently own goes into the family foundation. I oh, found fantastic. I, you got any daughters? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm married, by the way. So, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> somebody out there said I'm not. Um, <laughs> uh, the. Uh, um, so what in your perspective, and I want to, before I go to that question, I want, I want to, you've done a lot of investing in California and you and I have talked about it. And for those of you who don't know, Farmland Partners has about 30% of their billion and a half assets in California. Um, are you, I mean, in the almond industry, you were an early kind of pioneer and leader in that industry. What's your perspective on California now? Uh, compared to history and going forward? Petrified would be one word, Paul, number one. Yes, we were the third largest almond grower in the world at one point in time. It was a very profitable crop. It was a great crop. It's a fun crop to grow. But again, given the California water situation today, um, I can't get my arms totally completely around it. We've left the market and uh, uh, I'm not sure when we'll return. Yeah, I my, my perspective, I want to you know, hear your reaction to it is that if you have good water, as you work through Sigma and the other major changes going on in water supply in California, because of the unique climate and the high value crops, that there will, you know, we're all going to suffer a little bit in, the, in these changes, but there will be a place for strong investor returns if you come out the other side of this with a sustainable water situation. Do you agree with that? If you come out the other side of it with a sustainable water situation, Paul, yes, I agree. But again, the jury is still out, in my opinion. Some people would argue with me, but the jury is still out as to how many acres you're going to have to take out of production to sustain the balance of your water. And that's a real unknown, in my opinion. Well, I've kind of hoped they'll take the other institutional managers' <laughs> acres out of production and leave ours. I'm I mean, sure they will, Paul. I'll be fine. <laughs> I'll be fine. So what do you think is a long-term driver of farmland values? People talk about interest rates and other things, um, but what's your perspective on, w for the long-term hold investor, what really drives? The, the number one perspective, Paul, is, is global caloric intake of of. Of food. We have too many people starving to get death in this world today. Okay. Again, the need for food. Um, you know, I've on my iPhone, I have some pictures of bare shelves in, in, in uh, supermarkets in, in, in southern states here. Okay. And, and that frightens me, quite frankly. I didn't think I would ever see that in my lifetime. But that's the number one driver. But uh, the other dr main driver today, Paul. Um, Interest rates is not it, in my, in my opinion. Yes, they're very low. They're very, currently very reasonable. But the other main driver is a great desire 
by the investment community to have a quality, secure, zero vacancy investment. Great. We're going to open it up for questions for the last four or five minutes, if there are. And I know we're standing between you and the cocktail hour. So if there are none, I fully understand and sympathize. Um, but I don't know if, uh, if there's any questions. And I can't see from here. So, Jared, if there aren't any, I, you go I'm looking look around. Does anyone have a question for there's Paul one up Marty? front. Here. Oh, we have one. All right, yes, here sir. I come. One second, I'm coming with the microphone. I'd love your opinions on comparing US, obviously bullish, but what other regions in the world uh, would you guys be interested in understanding you have some constraints? Um, Murray, I'm gonna let you go first well, and I may add to it, but you have a great deal of experience. In South America, uh, Chile is the country that kind of fascinates me and it's very productive, uh, has so many diverse uh, um, soil types and climate types and so many different crops um, and a reasonably secure government and a reasonably secure currency. Uh, beyond that, yes, Australia, possibly, New Zealand, possibly, but outside of that, I hit a blank on the basis that many of these countries like Argentina, Venezuela, Brazil, uh, Poland, they just frighten me from a, from a government point of view and a security point of view. If I put X dollars into a given country today, I want to visualize that I can get that back someday. And that's not always the case. And the other problem, which most people have not stopped to think about, yes, there's some, been some great opportunities in Brazil, but there's no dual tax treaty between the U.S. and Brazil. And I don't know about you, but paying tax once is bad enough for me, but paying it twice would kill me. Yeah, I think, um, so, so in my career background, I was an emerging markets investment banker for a long time. Um, and I've traveled to, to all of the major ag regions in the world looking at investments, both when I ran the business privately and since we've gone public, and we've never invested. And it really comes down to a to a really, there's so much opportunity here in the US, in our opinion. We believe that the, the superpower of farmland investing is that long-term security, stability, compounding effect of appreciation with, with albeit modest current yield. And if you're really trying to turbocharge your investment, I don't think farmland's actually the way to do it. Go somewhere to some, maybe even some of the other industry. We just don't think you get rewarded as a US dollar-based investor for the country risk uh, that you would experience in most of those other countries, setting aside Australia, Canada, you know, there's some exceptions to that. But, but for most of the, you know, think how many, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say to me, well, I can buy land in, in, uh, in you know, Ukraine for effectively $1,200 an acre. Why? And it'll has the same yield in soybeans or corn is your land in Illinois at 12,000 an acre. Well, now we know that I'd rather be in Illinois at 12,000 than in Ukraine at 1,200. And it's just, and, and I just think that's true over and over and over again. Paul, I think the key thing that you just said in the, in the last sentence paragraph is there's still a lot of opportunities here in the United States that need to be harvested before we worry yes. about going to Argentina or wherever. Other questions? Doesn't look like it. I think Great. you've told everyone everything they need to know.